We welcome you all once again to our uh, morning Bible study. We have come to the last chapter of uh, uh, Peter, First Peter, and we hope to complete this whole book today. Uh, we have covered till the fifth verse of the fifth chapter, and uh, as you would notice uh, from uh, from Wednesday, you noted that the first five verses, uh, basically uh, second uh, verse two to verse five, uh, Peter writes to the elders in the church and how they should relate to uh, people. Uh, in the church, in the congregation. And the word elder uh, did not necessarily mean elders in the, in the sense of age, but rather responsibility. A presbyterion is the word used. And from the word presbyterian, we get the word, uh, uh, you know, presbyterian church, where they have a group of elders who manage the affairs of the church. There's not a single pastor in charge, but rather a group of elders. So elders can mean uh, leadership in the church. Also, usually, uh, elders were also people experienced, and uh, even in terms of age, they were elders. So the instruction given to them was about uh, how they should relate to people in the church. And then we go to verse six, or verse, or verse five. Uh, Paul uh, Peter writes, "Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older." All of you clothe yourself with humility towards one another because, he's quoting an Old Testament verse, Proverbs 3.34, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. In other words, Peter says, just as I've advised elders to know how to relate to people in the church or congregation, in the same way, young men, the advice to you is, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older and to be submission uh, to be submissive to anyone it needs humility because sometimes uh, you know your will and their will may be different and when both are different and their will elders will is not against the will of god then we have to obey so we have to submit it's only when the authority tells us something against the will of god we take a polite stand and refuse to obey because against God's will. But when the elder's will and your will are different, and both are not against the will of God, then we have to submit because they're elders. And for that, we need humility. And humility, the word humility, tapar uh, numa uh, is the word for humil uh, humbling. It means to make self low to make self low, meaning to make the other person uh, lift up the other person. And the expression of humility in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, is to consider others better than yourselves. So when the elders advise you, they give instruction to do, it's not against the will of God, but maybe it goes against your will, you submit. And to be able to submit, you have to humble yourself and when you humble yourself, what happens? God will lift you up in due time, as I mentioned in the verse 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. In due time. Don't forget that particular phrase, in due time. When you humble ourselves and we are right and we subordinate uh, our will against will, the other person's will, and we uh, humble ourselves and lift up the other person, we want to be vindicated. God will vindicate you if you are right. But then he will do it in due time. And wait for God's time to vindicate you. When you are right, other person is wrong. But both are not against the will of God. And therefore, you submit humbly, make self low. In due time, God will make the other person understand that you were right and they were wrong. So leave it to God and respect uh, elders in the church. In fact, even people who are elderly in age, in that culture, we're supposed to respect. For example, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. Let's not forget that Timothy was in Ephesus at that time as an elder. And he writes to him and says, do not treat older men harshly. Do not treat older men harshly. Rather, exhort them as if they were your fathers. 
an elderly person in the church in terms of age. Don't treat them harshly. Be polite and exhort them as if he was your father. Same spirit that the whole area of Western Turkey, the culture was such that they respected elders and it's a very important thing, a good thing to respect elders, to honor your parents, honor elders. And therefore, when you humble yourself, in due time, God will lift you up. Verse 7 seems a little out of place. If you compare verse 6 and verse 8, this seems a little bit out of place, but it's a very exclusive, standalone statement. Standalone statement. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Everybody has anxiety sometimes. The anxious thoughts come to everybody, as I often share. But then we must give it to the Lord and forget about the things that cause us to get anxious because the Lord cares for us and he will handle, he will deal with our anxieties. The battle is his, it's not ours. Even the Old Testament, the same verse in, in different ways is brought out. Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your anxieties upon him and he will sustain you. He will sustain you. Here it says he cares for you. What does Simon also? It says, cast all your anxiety upon him, the cares upon him, and he will sustain you. He will see you through the intervening period when you are anxious about something that might happen in the future. In the intervening period, he will sustain you because he cares for you. And uh, anxiety is something we should not keep in our hearts and minds. Anxious thoughts come to everybody. We should not be anxious. In Philippians chapter 4, 6 to 8, Paul writes, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and perishing with thanksgiving, Present the request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds on Christ Jesus. So whatever causes us to get anxious, possible events of the future, we give it to God, cast it upon Him, and don't think about it. What we think about thereafter is mentioned in the eighth verse. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about such things. So casting your cares, anxieties upon him means you give it to him and don't take it back. And what God gives us in return is rest for our souls. If we keep the anxious thought in the mind, we'll be burdened, weary and burdened. Mind is a weary we are burdened, we have a heavy heart. And Matthew 11, chapter 28 to 30, the Lord gave his disciples a blank check. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give rest. Take my yoke upon yourself and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Then we go on to the next verse, and in a way, 7th and 8th verse are related. Because the one who brings anxiety is the devil. God does not cause us to be anxious. We don't like being anxious. Nobody enjoys the feeling of anxiety. So where does anxiety come? From where does it come? From the evil one. So next verse onwards talks about what the evil one does, how we have to be alert. Was eight onwards. Be self controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Be alert, be self controlled. In other words, we should not be unaware of the devil's schemes. The word enemy here, enemy here, is a Greek word called antidikos. Antidikos means adversary. Or devil. Our adversary is the devil. Our enemy is not people. It's not flesh and blood. But spiritual force of evil in the heavenly places. And the word devil here, enemy is antidikos, adversary, devil. 
And the word devil used here is a word called diabolos. Diabolos. And from that word, we get the English word diabolical. Diabolical means what? Demonic. Of the occult. Your enemy, adversary, the devil. And the devil here is diabolos, which means Satan, devil, false accuser, slanderer. There are four meanings for diabolos. Four meanings. Satan. Satan actually means accuser in the Old Testament. Job chapter 1 verse 6, accuser. So diabolos is Satan, devil, false accuser, slanderer. He prowls on like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And he focuses on Christians because Christians don't belong to him. They belong to Jesus. The rest of the people, anyway, belong to him. He's not so much bothered about them. He only wants to make our life difficult because he is envious of us. They're going to the same place from where he came. He was once in heaven. He was banished from heaven. We are going to heaven. He's very upset with us, angry with us, frustrated, envious. So he likes to devour us like a roaring lion, not a biting lion, a roaring lion. Makes a lot of noise. But uh, he also knows that as Christians, we have been given authority over him. Luke 10, 18, 19, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority. Authority means vested authority, exousia in Greek. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Over all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. Devil knows that we have given authority over him. But we should tell him that we also know that. I know I have authority over you. And you better, I know. You better know, I know I have authority over you. He'll try to make a big noise around us, like a roaring lion, not a biting lion, looking for someone to devour. He tries to find a, a victim. But we resist him. Look at uh, James chapter 4, 7 and 8. It says, resist him, standing firm in the faith. We are called to be self-controlled and alert. To be alert is to be aware of the devil's schemes. To prepare for his the countermeasures to his actions. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul writes, We are not unaware of the devil's schemes. We as believers should, should not be obsessed about the devil's schemes. At the same time, we should not be unaware of the devil's schemes. We should be aware, alert, self control and realize that he troubles us. He tries to devour us. He can't devour us. He'll try to devour us. Looking for someone to devour. Look at next verse. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. Because you know. That the brothers. Throughout the world. Are undergoing the same kind of suffering. Suffering. The contest here is suffering. He brings suffering. He rode in land looking for someone to devour by bringing suffering to us. And therefore, we should resist him standing firm in the faith. We should be aware of the devil's schemes. He tries to trouble us in various ways. Number one, he will try to take our minds away from the Lord and thereby he tries to steal the peace God has given us. 2 Corinthians 11, chapter verse 3. The Apostle Paul expresses concern for the church in Corinth. I'm afraid that just like he was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind will be somehow led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. First method is to make a mind, take a mind away from the Lord. His methods, you should be alert to his methods. Second method, He'll try to tempt us in sin. Until we repent of our sins, from the time we sin till we repent, he will accuse us before the Father and he will try to work in us and make our lives miserable. 
In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, He is still at work in those who are disobedient. Still at work in those who are disobedient. When we are Christians also, we can disobey God sometimes. When we disobey God, He works in us, at work in our minds, oppress us, afflict us. Don't give Him room. First method is, take our minds away from God. His method. Second method is to try to tempt us to sin. When you disobey, he'll work in us, trouble us, oppress us, afflict us, demoralize us. Third method is to provoke us to get angry. If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, 26, 27, we read, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and don't give the devil a foothold. Some Bibles say, be angry but sin not. Ephesians 4.26, my Bible says, and it says, in your anger, do not sin. Some Bibles say, be angry but sin not. And you have to be angry in a godly anger, not human anger. God's anger is slow. Our anger is fast, quick. When God gets angry, he doesn't sin. When we get angry, we invariably sin. And therefore, we should understand that when people provoke us and we respond in anger, we lose control of ourselves. We are giving the devil a foothold. Once you give him a foothold, he climb on top of us. The third method. The fourth method is this. If you can't tempt us, if you can't take our minds away from the Lord, if you can't provoke us to anger, he will bring suffering. As you obey God, we face suffering to try to demoralize us, trouble us, and we stand firm in the faith. We are resistant by faith in God's word. And sometimes we think there's only one suffering. Here it says, Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. You're not the only one. Don't think you're the only victim. Every Christian goes through trials. And sometimes we think we're the only one suffering. But all of, all of the world, Christians, go through trials. And God has a purpose in that. He has an amazing purpose in that. Many purposes, in fact. At least 10 I know. I've shared it often in the, on our meetings. The peak out is there. Blessings of suffering. 10 blessings of suffering. So God allows these things to happen. Ultimately, for our benefit, we resist him standing firm in the faith. If you look at the armor of God, which is described in the 6th chapter of Ephesians, from verse 10 to 17, I'm sure you remember the armor of God. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, feet fit of the gospel of peace, shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Shield of faith, Paul writes, by which we resist the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, shield and sword are both movable. Helmet, breastplate, belt, shoes are all fixed. Shield can move. Because flaming arrows from the evil one come from different directions. Sword and shield go together. And as the arrows come, different kinds of suffering, trials, temptations, we resist standing firm in the faith, quoting scriptures, holding on to scriptures. You resist the devil, he will flee from you. So sufferings are an integral part of Christian life. We have to face it through, through uh, faith in the word of God. We were given the shield and the sword. Shield defends us. Sword offends the devil. He is scared of the sword. The sword, the spirit, word of God, offends, hurts the devil. Shield defends us. By faith, we stand against the devil. To the word, we make him cringe and run away from us. We're a system, run away from you. Don't have to fight him. 
Okay, look at verse 8. Beautiful. Oh, sorry, verse 10. Verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after suffer a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. God is not a spectator when he goes through trials. He's actively involved in giving us faith, giving us the word to resist the evil one. And after he go through the trials for a while, for a little while, he will himself restore us, make us strong, firm, and steadfast. This verse I will never forget because this verse God spoke to me at a time when I became a believer. The same day my wife fell sick with a mental illness. She had been to the hospital undergoing shock treatment. And everything seemed to go wrong when I accepted Jesus. The Lord gave me this verse. Going through trial now, a little while, I'll make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Little while, I did not know how long, but it turned out to be 15 years. 15 years went through the trial, but then God brought us out of it. He brought me out of it. He brought my son out of it. He brought my wife out of it. And together, we began to serve God subsequently. After 15 years, he healed her. And when the sickness happened, at that time, God spoke to me. That's why I never worried about her healing. A very bearing God said, I'm going to heal her. After some time, you go through trials. I'm a God of all grace. And therefore, at the right time, he brought us out. And the God of all grace, who called you to the eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after suffer a little while, will himself restore you, himself restore you. Restoration comes from him and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Or to me, dominion forever and ever. All glory must go to God. He's a God of all grace. God of all comfort. In the trials, he comforts us. After trials, he'll make us strong, firm and steadfast. All good things come from him. And therefore, while you go through trials, as the Holy Spirit will tell you, why are you going through trials? What have you done or not done for which you face trials? He'll counsel you and keep on praising God, never complain. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 16, 17, 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Rejoice always. Be cheerful always. Verse 12. With the help of Silas or Silvanus, his name is Silvanus, short form of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. This is the true grace of God. Silvanus or Silas was actually the one who wrote the letter. With the help of Silas or Silvanus, Peter I wrote the letter. The one who actually wrote the words of the letter was Silas, Silvanus. Because Peter's Greek was very, very poor. The first letter he wrote with the help of Silas. Second letter, Peter wrote himself, his own writing. And according to Greek scholars, second letter is very, very colloquial and very poor Greek. First letter is very refined Greek. Why refined? Silvanus wrote it. Silas wrote it. Peter only gave the spirit behind that. God spoke to him and he gave the, uh, the content. The words are put by Silas. Very refined, aristocratic Greek. Second letter, crude, colloquial Greek. That was written by Peter himself. He was not a... Uh, his, his mother tongue was not a Greek, remember? He was Aramic. He spoke Aramic. So it's a foreign language for him. And he was not... He was a fisherman. He did not... Uh, not as educated as Paul. And therefore, there was a problem of Greek. This is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. What does that mean? What is the true grace of God? The true grace of God is found in the 10th verse. And the God of all grace, who called eternal glory in Christ Jesus, after supper a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. He restores us. That's the grace of God. And stand firm in that grace. Everything you go through, are, is troubles you go through are temporary. Ultimately, he'll give you a victory. Stand fast in it. The grace of God. 
not in your holiness. In the first letter again of Peter, in chapter 1, from verse 13, Peter writes, Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Then he goes on to say, you must be obedient, be holy because God is holy. We don't put our hope in our holiness. We put our hope in grace. We stand fast in the grace of God. When you go through trials, we stand fast in the grace of God, the God of all grace, who will ultimately bring us out, make us strong, firm, and steadfast. Standing on grace also mentioned by Paul to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans 5, 1, he writes, since you, since you be justified by faith, we are peace with God, through whom we have access, uh, we gain access by faith in this grace in which we now stand. We gain access to Christ, to God, by faith in this grace in which we now stand. We stand in the grace of God, meaning our hope, our anchor is the grace of God. And that's why we hope in His grace, He'll never let us down. He draws out of every situation and ultimately will make us strong, firm, and steadfast. Verse 13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Uh, Babylon actually was the capital of, uh, uh, of the Chaldeans, Chaldea, and Chaldeans were people living in Iraq. In fact, Abraham came from there. His hometown was from Ur of the Chaldeans. Ur of the Chaldeans. You are Ur of the Chaldeans. And uh, he originally from there. And Babylon could be a physical Babylon or could be, a, uh, figuratively speaking, Babylon stands for tyranny, tyranny and autocracy. It could be that. But uh, whoever it is, is about somebody who was in Babylon. The original Babylon is actually between the Euphrates and Tigris and uh, Baghdad today, probably uh, where Baghdad was. But you know, remember one thing, all these cities of the olden days are below ground level, below ground level. So somewhere between Euphrates and Tigris, below the ground level is a Garden of Eden, also Babylon. Sends you her greetings, so does my son Mark. Mark is the same Mark uh, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Some Bibles say holy kiss, which is basically a kiss on the cheek. Peace to all of you who are in Christ Jesus. Meaning, preserve that peace. He wishes that they preserve that peace. And we all preserve our peace which God has given us through obedience by walking in the ways of God. We have finished exactly 9.30, the entire book of Peter. So on Monday, I'm going to start the second letter of Peter. And uh, please read, it's only three chapters, uh, second Peter. Uh, please read all the three chapters and come on, uh, on uh, Monday. It's very, very exciting, both the letters. You know, Peter wrote only two letters, can you imagine? Paul wrote 13 letters. Peter wrote only two letters. And uh, it's very interesting to see how his perspective of uh, his experience, all the years of experience he had with the Lord, three and a half years, he summed up probably in two letters, and that's why he took these two letters. We'll also go to the Gospel of John, maybe later on, much later. But uh, letters of John will do. But uh, Monday we'll do the second letter of Peter. God bless you all. And please come back on Monday with all the three chapters, having read all the three chapters.